I think that we're in a world where in order to meet the demand, this is what is going to be necessary. The implementation of microgrids is going to be necessary. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about something we haven't done before. We're talking about smart microgrids and we're going to have Mr. Grand Staples, who is the group manager over power and energy at Rovis's, walk us through this. So welcome, Graham. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. It's a beautiful um, Monday. It is. It is. I'm excited for this one. Like I mentioned in the, the intro, we haven't talked about smart microgrids, and maybe just lay a base for those listeners out there to, where this may be a new topic for them as well. What exactly is that? Well, that's a really good question, and I always answer this question by saying a microgrid means 100 different things to 100 different people. You hear about, about them a lot in the news. You hear about them a lot in trade publications and so forth. But really, it's any distribution of electricity with primarily they have generating assets that are in that distribution network. So you're able to generate your own power or you're associated with a group like a utility or a municipality or cooperative that can generate their own power. And you're controlling where that power goes. Mm -hmm. So that constitutes a microgrid, but a microgrid could be the size of a city or a region of the United States or... It could be as small as a single industrial campus or a university campus or a space like that. Okay. It could be even smaller. It depends on really who you're. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like they can be found in a lot of different places, but maybe how's that technology evolved? Because now we're talking about smart microgrids. I'm assuming that means in the past it used to be just microgrids. So now we have that smart component. So how has that evolution looked? Yeah, so for a long time, you've got your substations and your switch gear and your relays and breakers and so forth. A lot of people are familiar, even if you're not in the power space, a lot of people are familiar with the, the power panel in your house where you can go and you can flip the little breaker and turn the electricity off to a room or a section of your house. Now you just extrapolate that out to lots of higher voltage applications and, and bigger electricity loads. And that's what you're looking at when you're talking about the control of a microgrid, both in a smart sense and in a legacy sense. But it used to be that, and still is for a lot of people, that there's just these legacy breakers that are protecting you in the event of power surges or lightning strikes or shortings or just any sort of power event that could cause a surge and damage equipment or loads that are on that network. Those devices would just do their protective settings. They're very reliable. They're they're super solid. Nothing's going to really go wrong. They're very well tested and run in industry for forever and ever. They just set and forget that stuff. You've got engineers who come up with the protection schemes and you load them in and that's how they run. Well, smart microgrids allow you to have a more dynamic control where the the way that the microgrid reacts and the way that these pieces of equipment react to protect you can be done in a more intelligent way. So take the case of a hospital. You you may be performing, you may have an entire day of the week where you're performing some type of sensitive surgery in one wing of a hospital, but that wing of the hospital may not be active in performing those surgeries every day of the week, may only happen on a scheduled period. So now in a smart grid environment, you can say, you know what, if we happen to have a power event, we happen to have an outage, it is totally impossible for us to drop the load to this critical surgery, right? You've got human lives at stake. So I need to say, this is a a highest priority load and I can't let anything happen to that. So all my generating capacity, any backup procedures that I have, any transitions to another source, if the, the major utility drops me, I have to get power to this wing of the hospital. But then let's say that's a Monday. Then on Tuesday, well, that wing of the hospital is empty. So I'm gonna change the way that the microgrid responds to events. I'm gonna say, you know what? deprioritize this wing of the hospital as a protected area. If you got to drop a load, now all I'm probably running is lights and air conditioning or, you know, if that, don't worry about it, drop that, let the power go out to that stuff because there's no risk uh, or minimal risk. And instead I'm over here and 
making sure that the other wing of the hospital that, you know, is cycled through to be on schedule for that particular day of the week is being protected. The other thing that smart, smart microgrids allow you to do is get real information about the status of everything at a centralized location. So again, going back to the old way, you've got these substations, they're big gray metal boxes. They've got red and green colors on it, indicating the status of things, but primarily you're getting in a truck or you're getting in your, your, in your walking boots and you're going out into the field and you're looking at it, you're laying eyes on it to see what the status of everything is uh, or to do any type of investigation about, let's say you have an event, you gotta go out there and you gotta pull files, you gotta pull event recorder data and so forth off of those devices and say, okay, now I got to pour through this back at the office. Well, smart microgrids allow you to say from a centralized control room, I can look at with a campus example, I can look at the entire campus as a single line diagram and I can see exactly what sources are feeding, exactly what loads, what the current power conditions are. I've got measurements at each of these locations so I can see, okay, what kind of load do I have here? You can test things, you can trigger like test cycles for generation and so forth from central locations or from HMIs that the programming all exists in a, in, a, in a logic controller. So it's not relying on people pushing buttons, pulling levers, throwing breakers manually. It's doing it via intelligent control, more similar to an industrial control system. I mean, it's so just a couple of things I just pulled from what you were just saying there. You, you can really direct that power strategically the way that you design it. And then you also have that decision-making ability as from a monitoring standpoint, it sounds like that's next level monitoring when you have that smart microgrid in place. Yeah, we like to refer to it. A lot of folks refer to it as situational awareness. If I'm the energy manager for a campus, it's tremendously powerful for me to be able to look at a screen and say, okay, here's what's going on right now today and manage that. I can dispatch resources. I can do advanced planning. I can say, okay, tomorrow when I need to do maintenance over here, I'm going to switch my source to somewhere that's going to be more reliable for, let's say, my chiller plant. Like I'm, I'm going to be doing something that causes an outage. So I'm going to reconfigure the distribution of power mm -hmm. just from right here. And bearing in mind that for safety reasons, a lot of folks like to be able to go physically still out to the substation because you don't want to be making too many changes without visually verifying that there's no life safety risk and so forth. But still being able to see that from a management standpoint is tremendously powerful for both planning and control of what's going on and reacting to events. Because you know, ultimately at the end of the day, what the microgrid is trying to do is prevent you from having an outage due to something that's unforeseen. Right. You know, that that's one of its most critical applications. For sure. You know, for the industrial end user out there, Graham, are there any typical problems that that you see that that maybe push people towards the microgrid solution that maybe they hadn't thought of in the past? Yeah, so everybody is aware and routinely thinks about what to do if there's an outage. Like I mentioned, the ultimate base function of this is to protect you from losing power. But there are a lot of other applications that we see people starting to, to become aware of and participate in. Say you're an industrial customer and you've got a generator plant or the capability to generate electricity on site. Uh, usually with your utility, you've got some type of power purchasing agreement that says you're going to pay... X number of dollars per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. But if you go over, like in the summertime when the utilities are, are taxed because we're all using our air conditioner in the hot North Carolina August, That's right. the, the power company is going to say to this industrial customer, you can never exceed a certain amount or else we're going to penalize you because that's difficult for us to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you can make a decision through monitoring this in your microgrid and through looking at the data that's provided through this smart, intelligent uh, layer that you've applied to an old standard system, you can look at that information. You can say, okay, I know that at this point in production, I'm bringing on a smelter or activating an oven and my load is going to increase. I'm going to exceed this peak limitation that the utility has put on me, but I've got the ability to generate power too. So I'm my own power plant if I want to be. So now you can say, okay, let me spin up my generators. I'll generate however many megawatts of electricity that's necessary to keep me below that peak point. And I'll, the smart microgrid will help you to make sure that you're not violating any arrangements uh, that you may have with the utility while you do that as well. Right. So now we can avoid peak, that's peak shaving. And it's also a financial consideration. Take it away from even the energy management or the utility management folks on an industrial site. Now you're talking about financial considerations and you're talking about product manufacturing and the interface of the 
smart grid and what it can do for your plant manager or for the bottom line out of that plant. And we've had customers who they'll take what's typically a aluminum smelting operation and they'll, they will effectively become a power plant because it's more effective for them from a financial standpoint to sell their power back into the grid than it is to make their product wow. temporarily. That's awesome. So I mean, we may have a listener out there, Graham, and that's maybe their management, their plant management, whatever they may be, but you, you got their interest <laughs> and they're on board. They're, I want to get started. Is there a roadmap? I mean, what are some steps that you would recommend people to really consider to begin? So typically these assets that we want to be monitoring and controlling have, have lived in this kind of invisible space. It's like we talked about with the old dynamic of microgrids or kind of, I guess what some may still consider the standard dynamic of microgrids is you put it in and it does what it's supposed to do and you don't have to worry about it. You don't look at it or touch it or deal with it very often because it's not on the plant floor, it's supporting the plant floor. Really what we start with is we got to see what you've got. We've got to have a conversation about what is in existence? Where are the loads being distributed around camp, campus or around the plant? What level of smart technology do you maybe already have without even knowing it? Because some of these devices, even legacy devices, have a lot of information that could be put onto a, a bus network and pulled into a central location, but just nobody did that. It wasn't an aspect of the original installation. And then where are you deficient in smart technology? Like where are you using legacy stuff that's old enough that you need to be considering not just for the new smart applications, but you need to be considering this has reached end of life and you need, you need to get some new technology in here. So that is a great starting point for people is just to, to evaluate what they have as their install base mm -hmm. and really map it out. Uh, oftentimes, I know, Chris, we've had these conversations before. People, put, they have their drawing sets, but they're the drawing sets for the uh, as installed and they've been sitting in a bottom of a panel or wherever they've been, some dusty old file cabinet for a long time. Uh, lots of changes have been made and they're not exactly the most accurate drawing set. Taking the time and doing a front-end engineering design activity, a feed study and saying, okay, here's what we have. Let's update all of our drawings to current and then let's look at where we can go and get the most bang for our buck. We also ask people two questions really. Are you already having issues, whether it be power quality or power delivery? inside the plant or you have in places that when you have an event, you're dropping load and it's causing you to have to restart a whole production batch or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, are there places where they know that they can save energy if they had more awareness? So they can tie that to the way that production operates. So, you know, if they're not having obvious quality or obvious delivery issues where they can say, you know, yeah, we lose the utility feed and we've got to scrap a whole batch. Maybe it's, we need to talk about how you could run your operations a little bit more efficiently as it pertains to the cost of the electricity that you consume. Mm -hmm. And we can start to marry those things up and, and tie the power systems into the manufacturing systems. And that starts to move away from, I think, what most people would consider to be microgrids into more of just your advanced intelligence and data application space, because now you're starting to get into that world where you're collecting a bunch of information, a bunch of data, and you're trying to do analytics on it to tie it into all sorts of other systems, including like business and delivery systems that, you know, are well outside the space of your traditional microgrid. Yeah. And just to clarify too, it sounded like the launching point to have all these conversations is that install base evaluation where you're understanding what's there. And then from there, you can take with you and your engineers and the team that you work with, you come up with those recommendations and those potential paths forward. Absolutely. Yep. Beautiful. Yep. And anybody, you know, we were talking about predominantly from the standpoint of the plant model, you know, the industrial model where you've got a manufacturing line that this is all supporting, but you know, we can also talk about from the standpoint of campuses and district energy solutions where these folks have lots of personnel who are very highly aware of the microgrid or of their power distribution systems. For them, that install base evaluation is still important. That's still where we would typically start. Although they already have, uh, typically because it's their day-to-day -day life, they live with it. They already have a high degree of knowledge of what's there. Mm -hmm. But where we have the conversation with those folks is about where they could take it if they had some additional smart technology that was being applied. So, you know, when you've got a utility manager or a power distribution, you know, medium voltage distribution group, they've got maintenance and operators and, and management, uh, their whole infrastructure already established at a campus somewhere. That, those guys are 
power delivery gurus, they can tell you exactly which breaker needs to be switched to get power where it's needed and protect these loads like we've been talking about. But they often aren't aware of what the, the smart applications can really do for them. So we want to have a conversation about where are they spending their time? Do they have guys in trucks just scrambling around, responding to radio calls all day? Uh, you know, could we centralize some of this information? Could we get it at their fingertips? That's the other thing. Getting root cause analysis information or trending into mobile devices, literally in the hands of these guys who have to otherwise go read it off a chart can be tremendously helpful with, you know, comparatively minimum changes to, to their existing system. For sure. Now, how about headwinds, Graham? I mean, we know that there, there, there are always some, particularly with projects like this, any common headwinds that you would just want to advise people as they're, as they're listening to this topic uh, to think about going into a, a project w with a microgrid? Yeah, so common headwinds are the lack of infrastructure. You know, in order to make a smart grid work, it has to communicate. All these devices have to talk to one another and be aware of one another and communicate effectively. So we often see like you go and you talk even to those utility groups and you, they say, yeah, we'd love to do something like this, but I've just got islands. I've just got these systems that don't talk one to the other and I'm not gonna dig trenches and lay fiber to get this very remote substation to be talking. The answer to that or the conversation that we like to have when we encounter those headwinds is to bring in our networking specialists and talk about what types of alternative technologies for remote communication, batching of sending of information, edge analytics. That's another big terminology that you'll hear in, in the trades these days. You know, what can we do to more specifically and intelligently get that information from where it's generated to where it's needed that maybe saves them a, a tremendous investment in some cases of trying to lay fiber or do the infrastructure? development. That's a major one that we encounter quite frequently. I got you. Now, how about there's listeners who sometimes examples paint that picture. I know you've got a couple of great ones that we talked about just getting ready for this conversation. What can you share there that, that may help put, put it into a, a better context for a listener? Sure. So um, I'll share an example from St. Joseph's Hospital. Okay. These folks knew that they needed, I don't know if all the listeners will recollect this or where everybody's sitting while they're hearing this, but most people will recollect Superstorm Sandy and the impact that it had on New York. I think that was in 2012. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of electrical delivery was impacted. And so there were regulations that came out of that and evaluations that came out of the response and how they could better handle keeping power in their critical areas, such as hospitals, when you have an event like that. And one of the things that came from that is St. Joseph's Hospital said, we're going to add the capability to generate power ourselves to a greater extent than they already had, which was a, a massive project. You know, that was lots of people that was designers and contractors and engineers of record and all, all the normal alphabet soup of people who are participating in a giant capital expenditure like that. And Robesys was a part of it. We were the systems integrator brought in. They had an existing utility plant control system and they had the microgrid control system, which was gonna help them, as I articulated before, with the considerations in a hospital environment about where loads need to go. They wanted to be able to control and prioritize what happened when they had an event and also incorporate the, the ability to generate their own power into their existing plant control system. So they wanted this to be an all-encompassing application that that interface seamlessly with all the stuff they already did from a utility and support of the hospital standpoint. So there was a lot of design activity, as you can imagine, with a project like that, where we laid out in great detail what would be delivered from our scope and then also from all the rest of the contractors who were involved, the scope that was going to be delivered. We do a lot of internal testing on a system like this before it gets put in the field, as you can imagine. So we did extensive internal tests and factory acceptance testing where we have the panels all fabricated and basically everything but the actual uh, relays connected. So we had all the controls and logic staged in our facility where the customer was able to come in and, you know, we can measure the outputs and see that we're sending the right signals and that all these events are happening in a simulated way that makes everybody really comfortable. We've taken that a step further recently, actually, even since the St. Joseph's Hospital project. And we now have a very extensive test bench where we're able to put actual relays in place and simulate that real world environment. There's no load, there's no high voltage or medium voltage power, but you can actually go to the relay faceplates and see that all these things are behaving as they should. So that's been tremendously helpful in testing all these different scenarios. 
But then you've obviously got another component, which is delivery to site and the commissioning aspect of it. So mm -hmm. at St. Joseph's, we went out and we commissioned these systems separately. So on the one hand, we had a load management system, which was helping them to do that prioritization and do that handling of load when they had an event. It also helped them to make sure that they maintained the regulation import from the utility. So there's usually stuff where you're not allowed to export power to the utility unless you've got an agreement to do so. You know, they don't want you to put power into their grid because they don't have control over it. Um, so you got to put in protection to keep that from happening. So we commissioned all of that and then we commissioned the process control side of it where we integrated it into their existing plant control system. They could see everything from essentially one screen or one location. That's a typical process for us. That's very cool. I know you guys have a wonderful article and we'll make sure that's in the, the show notes for our listeners so they can go check that out because that's St. Joseph's example that, that Graham, you just walked us through. It definitely pulls it all together on the smart grid. So thank you so much for that. And I was thinking as you were walking through that, there's a lot of people just in that project who were involved to make a project like that happen. So who is typically involved from the end user standpoint, as well as partners like yourself to make a smart grid, a smart microgrid project actually come to fruition? So usually we are interfacing with that facilities and utilities group. So the folks who are responsible for keeping the lights on, keeping the water running, keeping steam provided, heating and air conditioning, working on either a campus or in an industrial setting. You've got your SWAT team of experts who's responsible for all of that. They're integral to this process. You cannot do a job without those folks being heavily involved. In, in addition to that, there's typically an engineer of record. So that's somebody who's helping either define the design. They're either defining the entirety of the design or they're helping to define it. They're stamping the drawings and putting their seal of approval on everything. And they're also evaluating, deciding on the protective relay settings that need to go in. Mm -hmm. um, on a larger capital job like St. Joseph's Hospital, there may be a general contractor who pulls all this stuff together on behalf of the customer. Very essential on a large job to have that coordination component and that overall oversight of the job. You've got electrical trades people. So you've got electricians who have to be savvy and working in a medium voltage environment or even a 480 volt environment, there is life safety risk and you're working in hot systems at, at times. So you've got to have folks who have that understanding and that experience because that's very important. In addition to that, when we get into the uh, plant environments, the industrial manufacturing environments, it goes best if you have some representation from the product or plant manufacturing side, okay. because you really want to understand what some of the trials and troubles are of those folks as well and make sure that what you're doing is addressing needs that maybe the utility folks don't get exposed to. They're just not in those conversations. They're not in your daily operations planning debriefs or your shift handoffs. You want to hear from those people and make sure that they've got a voice as you build a system like this. Uh, so you can address their needs. It's, it sounds like it's just across the board with so many different tentacles and a lot of communication. And, I, and then when you had the smart component, I guess at some point you're crossing that ITOT bridge as well, right? Absolutely. Yes. We've all seen in the news, the uh, hacks and ransomware attacks and so forth. The attention to the security, cybersecurity of the systems that we deliver has never been higher. It's never been more important than it is today. It's critical infrastructure. These systems that you're putting in place, a microgrid delivers the power to where it is needed. It's, it's a prime target for bad actors to come in and try and take control of this. You know, if that does happen, there are serious consequences to events like that. So we like to air gap and IT and OT personnel that we work with, they like to air gap these systems, meaning keep them as isolated as they can. But that's a difficult balance, right? Because we're talking about putting important data into the hands of people who need it, who may be on a different network. You know, they may be on your general plant or campus network, and you're not wanting to create vulnerabilities by giving unnecessary access to this critical infrastructure. So that conversation is very delicate. Uh, it needs a lot of attention. It needs a lot of intentional planning about what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to get that done. And it's it really, you need to set it up the way that we try and deliver these. We want it to be something that is maintainable for our customers. We don't just want to deliver this and then the infrastructure itself never gets looked at again. You need patching. You need vulnerability assessments. You know, you need occasional penetration testing and things of that nature to make sure that the system stays as strong as it can stay throughout its life cycle, which can be 20 and 30 years long. So you've got this continuous upkeep that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. 
No doubt. I'm thinking out there right now, Graham, we've covered so much on the microgrids. And there may be listeners that they want to get started. They want to learn. They, maybe they, they want to take their career down this path. Where do they start? Where should they start investing some time or studying to really get into this field? Well, so in a university setting, like if we're talking about students who are, who are coming up, electrical engineering, power systems is a discipline in, inside of electrical engineering. Not everybody goes that direction. There's a lot of different variability inside that degree, but there's a tremendous amount to be learned about these systems. So I always recommend anybody with just a budding interest in power systems technology and microgrids to, you know, investigate that type of coursework if they're in the environment where they can do that, if they're young enough or mm -hmm. starting uh, over in their college career, that's always a great place to go. Um, today, there are a lot of great organizations that participate in this industry. So there's clean tech organizations in the Raleigh area. There are international organizations around power systems, campus energy systems, district energy. So lots of good resources out there. Also, there are lots of good publications available. So there are trade publications magazines, you know, white papers and scholarly articles that come out all the time on this. Some of that can be a little bit of deep water. You have to choose wisely, but um, just paying attention to the trends in technology. And honestly, Chris, if you watch the news, we talked about the, the hacking situations and the ransomware situations a little bit. Pay attention to what these folks are saying is actually being affected. The ability to maintain keeping the lights on is a prime target for attack. And when you're listening to these people or reading these articles in newspapers and uh, publications online, they're explaining what these systems are for the layman so that you can understand it if you don't necessarily have deep background in this type of technology. The other place that I would recommend that people go to learn or the other discipline that I would recommend people learn is control systems. Because really what we're doing here, if you take, take a step back and look at what smart microgrids are, it's the application of technology that's been in place for decades now at the plant floor. You're talking about doing intelligent automated control of a system that is essentially a state machine. You know, it's delivering power and it's delivering power in this current configuration. And you lose the ability to deliver that power, you reconfigure the state machine so that you're delivering power from another place. You know, at the end of the day, that aspect of it is not incredibly complicated at, a, at that high level. What we're doing is we're applying technology that's been out there for, like I say, decades to be able to give you some insight and some control over what that state machine is actually doing. So understanding what's out there from a control standpoint, you know, what, what are control systems? What do they do? What's a PLC? What's a distributed control system at ECS? Yeah. Just learning a little bit more about that can really be tremendously helpful when you're thinking about how you're going to do a smart microgrid or implement a smart microgrid, you know, learning some of those facts. And, Good advice. Uh, Good. And we'll try to link some of those resources you mentioned in the show notes. It's definitely a lot of different areas that people could invest their own time in to get better. So thank you for that, Graham. And this has been wonderful. We call it Eco Ask Why. We usually wrap, wrap up with the why. So I'm curious here on what, you're on the, what the why would be here for you around why are our microgrids so critical for that future growth? And as we're talking about safety. We talked about the way industry is expanding in the future. So what is the, the why behind the microgrids? Well, Chris, I think for me, the why, it's kind of an interesting question because I think it's happening. I, I want to participate in this because it is inevitable. Like we are all going to be in a situation where we have renewable and legacy or coal-fired or gas-fired utility being provided to us that we have a tremendous degree of control over. Um, you know, you're seeing it start to pop up now where Lots of homes have solar panels on them or battery walls installed in them. All that technology is going to scale. It's going to be something that major, large industrials have the capability to do. We're not getting rid of natural gas generation anytime, I don't think in my career, but you're going to see the shrinking of those assets mm -hmm. so that you can put them at industrial sites or on campuses. You're already seeing that. It's just going to get easier and easier. It's just going to get easier and it's going to get cheaper, I believe. If you pay attention to the things that major utility companies say are going to be coming down the pipeline. It's these shrinking circles of control, each of which can be looked at as a microgrid right down to the end consumer at your house. Whether you choose to, if you have a power outage, whether you choose to keep the lights or the AC on or run the washing machine will be a choice that you can make pretty easily, probably from your phone. So, you know, you just extrapolate that out into the broader industry and into these campus environments and industrial manufacturing plants. I think it's happening. 
So the why for me, the why, why do I participate in this? Why do I get excited about microgrids? Is because the opportunity is gigantic. And I want to be, I want Rovisys to be, and I want to be at the forefront of setting the pace here and being a participant in this sea change that I think we're going to see and already are seeing coming down the line. No doubt. And that is why, my friend, we asked you to, to walk us through this is because your passion behind it. So this has been wonderful. A lot of show notes here. The listeners, go check that out and you can connect with Graham directly on LinkedIn. Check out Rovisys, the wonderful things they're doing there. So you'll find all those links there and Graham, thank you so much for taking the time and explaining smart microgrids to us today. Well, thanks, Chris. I really enjoyed it, and I hope your listeners get something out of it, and I'm happy to talk further with anybody who wants to reach out to me directly. Absolutely, man. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.